All right, yeah, we're gonna get started because we've got a lot of slides to run through here. So, um, and we wanna to try to get in under an hour. If you guys have questions as we go through, please feel free to shout it out, um, but we can always go back at the end as well. So it's really exciting to see all of you here um, for NXT because we've been, you know, the pandemic kind of messed things up a little bit. So we're starting up again um, and it's exciting to have a lot of you with, with interest here. So. I'm Harrison, I am the president of the club, um, and I've got Alex and John, if you guys want to introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Alex, uh, third year computer science major, I am the treasurer of the club. I'm John, I'm the some year Beanie and Soyce. Um, uh, my last name is Hacker, which tends to get people a little bit of a chuckle since the industry I'm going to go into. I'm the vice president of the club. Sweet, no problem. Yeah, so we will start by giving all of you that work. Oh, it's just slow. Yeah, so we'll start by talking about what a BCI is. So BCI stands for Brain Computer Interface. So in this group, we are working with neurotechnologies that take inputs from electrical signals generated by neurons in the muscles and the body. So we'll talk about that, some applications, and teach you guys um, a non-technical understanding of how they work. Then we'll talk about this organization, things that we've done in the past that we help, hope to do in the future, and some resources that are available to all of you talk about some previous projects um, and then yeah talk about ways that we can get involved and if you guys are still here at the end and uh, want to come up we have our lab space up on the top floor um, so we can show you some of the hardware that we have uh, we also have a lab space downtown but that's for just for research stuff so um, yeah so that's what we are going to cover okay difficult view of this yes just click on the just click yeah um, all right so Neurotechnology is probably somewhat of a new word um, for you guys. It's not really in public vernacular, although um, uh, Elon Musk with his, uh, neural, or with his neurotech company Neuralink has certainly helped generate some interest. But John, could you, uh, if you feel comfortable, could you tell us what uh, neurotech is? Sure. So on the screen. <laughs> uh, this is just me reading off. It'd be pretty hard for me to mess this up, but um, we'll see if I can. So neurotech is any device that records, stimulates, or interfaces with the brain and nervous system. Should I elaborate a bit more, Harrison? Well, I will. Yeah, there's some more slides here. So you guys are probably familiar with some of these devices, for as an example. Yeah, yeah. We have on the uh, your left, my right, the an MRI machine, um, and on the left we have some EEG. So that's actually primarily what our club does, mm -hmm. with the, which that is electroencephalography. Um, and you can think of that as just an electrode that measures your brain waves at the surface of your skin. So completely non-invasive, we're not sticking anything into you, but we can read some of what your brain is doing by them. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, so there are there are three types of neurotechnology. One of them is for recording. Probably have also seen uh, MRIs as well. And so all of this, we don't have MRI machines, obviously, because they cost millions of dollars, but this is all within the scope of neurotechnology. Next one is stimulating, which oh. you know something about. So. Oh, yes. Well, I can talk a lot about this. Um, my startup, I'm doing a startup in this space. And so TMS, that's transcranial magnetic stimulation. You can think of it as inducing electric current via changing magnetic fields. Um, this is usually used in clinical practices at the moment. We do not have access to this. We have DBS, which we definitely don't have access to. This is an invasive uh, alternative, which helps treat things such as Parkinson's or essential tremor. Um, and on the right side, we have focused ultrasound stimulation, which is the non-invasive options out of threes three. It can specifically and non-invasively and to depth stimulate parts of the brain or other, it can be used on other organs as well. And this has a lot of potential. This is actually what our startup is using. Um, yeah, absolutely. So just the, we'll go into some more depth about the technologies that we actually use. But the idea here is that we have devices that can modulate, that can change neural activity, uh, which can be helpful for helping people with like depression or anxiety, but they're also brain computer interfaces. So where we have this, this input, we can actually um, transmit information into the brain. It's very low fidelity right now, but we can talk about what that is. And so the last one is more what we deal with, which is brain computer interfacing. Um, and this is basically where we have a combination sometimes of stimulating and recording, or we're taking in signals and then actually doing something um, with a computer or a machine based on the signal. So you can develop certain types of control interfaces and stuff like that. And so uh, what can this be used for? So I'm just going to go through some examples here. 
So this is using that electroencephalography, the non-invasive brain recording that John has talked about before. Um, and basically this person is looking at the screen, they're all letters there, and as they flash, they flash at different frequencies, which is something you can pick up at the back of the brain. So this is being used for a typing application here. Um, this is all controlled by brain signals, but you can use this as a control scheme for a lot of different things. Um, these are prosthetic arms, so collecting electric signals um, coming down from the brain to the spinal cord and then out into the peripheral nerves. And so you see that he has a reasonable level of dexterity with that. Um, this was from 20 years ago, so this field really has been progressing quite a bit, but this is a direct brain implant that's allowing him to move a cursor around uh, on a screen, and there's also a typing application that comes along with that as well. Um, so that's really useful for people with like ALS or muscular dystrophy that can't move uh, their, their arms or maybe can't speak. Um, it gives people a, a window into the world to be able to talk through. Uh, this is again using EEG to the person is imagining himself walking and it's controlling a exosuit um, right there to allow him to walk. Uh, he was paralyzed from the waist down, I believe. This is again flashing application for VR control. And don't worry, like, well, the stuff that you guys need to know, we'll focus on in a lot more depth and just roll through kind of ideas of what this stuff can do. Um, this is a very simple application where you focus on the drone hovering and it actually goes up. Again, using EEG, this is something that's very, very easy to implement um, compared to a lot of this other stuff. This arm is uh, actually allowing her to feel sensation. Um, she can feel temperature and touch coming from that ball, and then uh, she is also controlling that um, directly with her mind just by imagining moving her arm. And then I think this is the last one here, but this is a company that's acquired by Facebook. Um, and they're collecting electric signals that would be going to, or that are going to the muscles in your fingers and forearm to control a hand um, in virtual space. So this could be used for VR to create more uh, human um, interfaces in VR as opposed to holding sticks. And for me, this is kind of where, I wonder if I have that, yeah. So for me, this is kind of, what excites me about neurotechnology is the ability to create more human interfaces, to create things that are taking in real-time feedback from our brains and from our bodies to make things that are more intuitive. And so we've shown you a little bit of examples of where the field is right now, but if we think of just brain-controlled devices, I'm sure we can all come up with you know, crazy scenarios of a very cool device that uh, you could make with that stuff. So I encourage all of you, whether we're implementing it or, or just thinking about it, to kind of think of some wild ideas that you could use a brain controlled element for. All right, so we're going to go into a little bit of information about how they actually work, um, but we'll have more events later to go uh, into some more depth. Um, and again, BCI stands for Brain Computer Interface. So basically to really, really boil down um, what you're going to do with a brain computer based system is you have to collect the data in some way. Um, I, you know, it has to be in real time. So you're collecting in that data. Um, and that can be something like EEG. There are other technologies that we'll talk about as well. And then you have to uh, encode that data. So the data is usually really messy. So you've got to filter out some of the bad data and then try to figure out, okay, what are we actually looking at? And that's obviously going to change quite a bit based on the application. And then we have the input into a machine or, um, or a computer or something like that to do whatever the desired task is um, that you guys want to do. Um, so there are many different types of, of neurotechnologies. Um, and we are just going to focus on um, the non-invasive ones, obviously, because we're not going to be doing brain surgery here. So I'm sorry if that was something you guys wanted to do. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but there is a lot of this going on over at U of R. We do have affiliation with them as well. So we would like to have some people come in on a board and talk about some of the work that they're doing on monkeys and stuff like that. But basically there are three kind of designations of neurotechnologies. So you have the non-invasive ones that are you know, not causing any damage to the person sitting outside of the skull. Um, you have semi-invasive, which is this thing right here. This is a thin pad that is under the skull, but on top of the brain. So it's not penetrating brain tissue. And then you have this thing up on the top, which is called a microelectrode array, which uh, refers to, so you have invasive uh, electrodes that are placed into brain tissue. The DBS that he talked about earlier is a large electrode that hits deeper areas of the brain. So obviously those are invasive, they're displacing brain tissue, 
but you have higher accuracy and you can do more things with them. So that's where that little cursor movement um, was able to come from. And recently, a really cool study using some of those invasive um, electrodes is actually able to see someone, look into someone's brain and see them imagining handwriting letters. And they're able to do that and translate it to actually typing about 90 characters per minute, which is really good for, for Neurotech. Um, and then another one where they're able to see them imagining words um, and actually uh, put that into, into type. So it's really crazy what, uh, what that stuff is doing already. So I wanna talk about some of the technologies that we have uh, that we have access to or some of the more simple ones to work with. So this first one is called electromyography, um, which we abbreviate down to EMG. There are a lot of these kind of big buzzwords that are hard to remember, but luckily there are always acronyms that we can um, that we can honestly uh, too many acronyms <laughs> foiled down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so basically, EMG is placed in. You have two points that you place across any muscle in the body, and that's going to measure the difference um, in electrical activity across that area. And then you can essentially use that as a button or a graded control system um, so where you can apply different intensities um, to control an object. Um, so it is detecting electrical potentials. And this is a really, really easy technology to work with because the signals are huge compared to some of the other things that, that we do. The reason why it's huge is that muscles in our bodies act as amplifiers for neurons. So a neuron stimulates a muscle and then you get a huge, huge uh, spike in electrical activity, so it's it's quite easy to work with. Um, yeah, so again, these are these are the spikes that that we're talking about. So even if you were just starting out with this, um, like day one, and you wanted to learn how to use some of this stuff, we can hook up these boards here. It's this is showing like it's a, it's very very janky. This was an early prototype to drive a car, um, but you hook up these little boards here, which are like thirty forty dollars, I believe. To an Arduino, and then you get these signals. And so you can see this is a very clear muscle activation. This is like a pulse. Um, and you could just set a threshold here and say, okay, if this value goes over this line, then I want to execute a button, button press. And so you can think that's a really easy way to apply that to your, uh, your projects. And you can effectively turn any muscle that's large enough um, into a button. So you can have a lot of function. I like to think about the flappy bird. When we talk about this. Yes, we'll, uh, that'll, that's right here. So one of the first projects that we would use to, to train people, and so as we'll talk about um, in a little bit, this used to be only a research organization. So we would go through a little bit of training and then have people um, work, on, work on different projects. So this was one of the things that we used to train because it's so easy. Um, Flappy Bird, hopefully you guys uh, remember, is a, a, a game where this little bird, you would just tap on the screen. So it's an easy, uh, it's an easy example of how to use EMG. Um, this is the RC car example that I was talking about. So he basically uses, if he squeezes both biceps, it goes forward, right bicep goes right, left bicep goes to the left. Um, so that was a little project he was working on as well. Um, I cannot get that direction right. And this is Colin, he is the, um, he is the other founder of this organization. We founded it back in 2018. And you can see that he is just uh, using uh, EMG in a jaw clench to control a prosthetic arm. And you can see that this is graded because as he clenches more, it closes the, the fist. But as he clenches a little bit, it can kind of open. So you can also, once you get a little better with this stuff, um, you can you know, apply a gradient to what you're doing as well. All right, so electroencephalography, EEG, is very, very similar to EMG, except we are now putting the electrodes on top of the head and we're dealing with smaller signals. It's very cheap compared to other neurotechnologies. We have these devices up here, which cost, uh, that one costs about $500. We have a couple other ones that cost about 800. And when I say that's cheap, this is compared to previous clinical systems that would cost between $30,000 and $80,000. So it's really exciting that a lot of these consumer devices have been coming up that allow us to actually work with this. Um, so it has very high temporal resolution, which just means that 
Um, it gives immediate feedback, so you can get uh, data and do stuff immediately with it, but low spatial resolution, which means that you don't have a high degree of accuracy when you're imaging from different areas. Um, some other things that are kind of important. How, how are we doing so far? Is this, am I going too fast? Is everybody okay? We're all good? Awesome. Um, so, so here's an example. Again, Colin is focusing. Um, and so just focusing, thinking like, oh, I want this, this robot to you know, move his head. Um, it's a very simple application, but you can see when, that, when the focus uh, goes above a certain threshold, um, it just causes the robot to, to do that. So again, similar to, to uh, EMG, you can use this as a control system. Um, this is a very, very simple example of what you can do, but um, that shows that the, the BCI is working. Um, again, this is the thing I showed earlier. It's called SSVP. That's not really important right now, but also using uh, EEG to detect um, where the person is looking. And then this is, uh, so we primarily use these devices here, which is from a company called OpenBCI. This is what their software looks like. And so when you're putting on the device, this is um, one, of the, one of the screens that you're presented with. And so we can see from eight different electrodes there, the data that we're getting um, off of the brain. And so once you learn how to work with this, you can either set thresholds, which is easier, or if you get into machine learning and stuff, you can start to analyze some of this to, um, to you know, do whatever the application is that you're working with. But that part gets very hard as you can imagine. The last thing that I want to say about EEG is that it's showing us brain waves. And so brain waves is showing collective neural activity. So as neurons are firing together, we have larger spikes. And as they're firing separately, we have uh, higher frequency, smaller spikes. Um, and so these are classified into beta, alpha, theta, um, and delta waves, and also gamma waves. So delta waves is what you see during sleep um, and high relaxation. Theta waves, um, also relaxed state, you might be awake, might be asleep. Alpha is normal awake state, and then beta and gamma are high focus state. And so these are easy classifications to work with. So you can use these to do certain emotional testing um, based on previous uh, information that's out there, um, and then also um, you know, focus and stuff like that. All right, so we've got two more that we don't have access to right now, but they're technologies that are coming soon. Uh, so this is called magnetoencephalography, or MEG. These are very expensive um, and usually not portable, although this company, Kernel, is uh, working on a device that is portable. They're not portable because they're working with very, very small magnetic sig signals as opposed to electric ones. And so that's subject to really, if you have a magnet in the room, a phone in the room, even the Earth's magnetic field that can throw off the data. So you usually need a shielded room, but it gives you better um, imaging capabilities than EEG. And so it can kind of take that same methodology, take it a step further. And then another technology that we will probably be getting soon is functional near infrared spectroscopy. Again, I know these terms are complicated at first, um, but the concept is, is somewhat simple. Basically, it's um, able to look at the brain and determine how much blood flow is going to different areas. And so if you have more blood flow going to one area, that means that area is more active. Um, and that way you can say, okay, this, this brain area that does this thing is active, so the person wants to do this thing. Um, and so these are getting a lot cheaper. The company OpenBCI has one for about $600, so we'll try to get one of those soon. Okay, so that's enough for the technologies. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about this organization and kind of what you guys can do within it um, and what we can offer. Uh, so NXT or the Neurotechnology Exploration Team, as I mentioned, was uh, started in 2018 and it started as the first uh, student-run research group that RIT had. So we approached the VP of Research uh, here at RIT and he gave us a generous grants and lab space and a little bit of equipment to get started on some research objectives, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more about what those, what those projects were. Um, and it's also uh, towards the, the later years, um, the last, well, last year or so, um, we also brought on some U of R students as well. I, I am a dual student. I take classes over at U of R and here. Um, I, I take my neuroscience classes over there. And so we have some connection there as well. So it's a good opportunity to work 
um, with an intercollegiate team as well. The program that Harrison does that through is the RIC. I was just me. You guys check it out if you're interested in neuroscience courses at U of R. Yeah, RIT will actually pay for you guys to take uh, up to two classes a semester at U of R as long as you're taking 12 credit hours here. And I highly recommend it um, because, I mean, why not? It's a different university to experience. And basically, you just have to find a class that RIT does not have a comparable alternative to. Um, and for me, RIT doesn't really have neuroscience. So I get access to classes at an excellent medical university and don't have to pay their much higher prices. I'll also years. note that it's not capped towards your credit maximum, which is quite nice if you tend to be overloaded. Um, <laughs> no, I know that's not a case with the, yeah, the program design. It, it's the RAC form. So Rochester Area Collegiate. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry for interrupting you there. No, no, I appreciate that. No, that was that was important. And if anybody wants to talk about that, you can always email us or we can talk about that and we can help you with that. Um, sorry, we've got someone on Zoom. Okay, there we go. Close captioning is not had that at the beginning. Um, yeah, so we were recognized in, in a couple articles. We were on the cover of University Magazine for uh, a wheelchair project that we were building, and it's still we we still hope to continue working on that but a wheelchair using imagined uh, movement to help uh, control the device for people with like ALS or muscular dystrophy um they did a video on us and then there have been some some articles as well um and so you know we always go to like maker fairs and events like that to show what we've been working on so if people are interested in that you can see some of the things that we're working on it's always fun when we can, uh, you know, let kids do some stuff because they, you know, their face just lights up, you know, to control stuff with their minds, see their brain waves, control um, little RC cars or whatever. Um, we also were sent out to Dubai um, in 2019, which is a fun thing that <laughs> I will never not like talking about. Um, but yeah, they, they paid for us to go out there and uh, present at a maker fair um, and we got an award and that was that was very cool um so yeah again kids love this stuff we built a mario game that was controlled uh using emg and so we had a little competition for people and so this kid was using uh, different muscles to to play the game and then you know imaginary tea and stuff as well for the first years you might not uh know a whole lot about this yet but Usually, outside of a pandemic, RIT has a very big uh, event where clubs can show off what they've been working on. Um, and it's really cool. It, it can draw like up to 40,000 people. 40, yeah, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a lot of people. Um, and then we've made a ton of videos and stuff as well, if, if, you, if you guys are interested in uh, you know, looking through some of the cool work that we've done. Um, I'm going to give you a brief uh, overview of what some of the teams have done. And then we'll talk about uh, NXT as a club, which is which is what this is. So, so yeah, the wheelchair team, as I mentioned before, building a wheelchair for people that can't use the joystick. Um, so maybe they would have uh, either an amputation or um, a neuromuscular disorder that would prevent them from using their muscles. Uh, and so, it's they're building it to be computer vision guided, um, and then uh, using when it gets to a decision point, so like the end of a hallway motor imagery which is imagined movement so think right think left think forward think back um, to actually control the device uh can people on zoom hear me okay i realize i've been oh it's trans okay um yeah so that's that project uh fabric electrode team uh so when you're using emg you usually use sticky wet electrodes which are disposable creates a lot of waste um and you have to place them in the right spot. They were working on making electrodes that would just fit into clothing. Um, and they made a couple of boards for that as well. Thought keyboard team is working on a way, again, using imagined movement up, down, left, and right to control a cursor around them on a screen. And then the prosthetics team, which Brian is the lead for. Can you give us a little overview of what you guys did? Yeah. So uh, what we were attempting to do was uh, add a secondary uh, free of motion into the press tank. Usually you see like hip hand grips and very rudimentary like lateral motion. We were trying to implement rotation into the wrist as well as doing your own touching, extension, and We had our own design.
design that is the hand that you see up there that we will our members spent a whole bunch of time doing. Um, and yeah, that, that's about it. We used EEG or EMG, sorry, not EEG. Uh, and we were going to be working with Fabriskin because with those electrodes that Harrison just talked about, they're one time use. And if they stay on you for about 30 minutes, they tend to be very big notes. Sarah, have a question. <laughs> Um, and the games team here uh, was developing out um, a, they, they made their own engine and everything, which is kind of crazy, um, to make a game where you could control, it's really hard to, to see here, but you could control an, um, a virtual car uh, using muscle signals. So basically just taking that project that you saw before and translating it into the digital realm, which they hoped would be uh, useful for people like physical therapists, where they can put in I want them to pump their muscle X number of times and we generate a track to you. Try to figure out how to go back. Got this, Harrison. There we go. All right. So you hear some of the stuff I've been talking about in the in the past tense, and we've certainly done a tremendous amount of work. We would like to continue some of this stuff, but because of, because we had to take a year and a half break, we were working with largely undergrads. A lot of these leads that were running these teams have graduated and moved on um, to uh, you know to bigger things. So we would love for people to continue some of these projects, um, but you know now it is a club, which we hope will make it a little bit easier of a barrier to entry and Alex a little bit. Yeah, so like Harrison said, we want to be a lower end barrier of entry because uh, in the past years, the research team had like a lot of commitment. Oh, and is that my limit? Um, no, do. Yeah. Um, yeah, like so in past years, the research team had a lot of commitment, but uh, now we want to focus on more teaching the new generation how to like use this technology or what this is or just foster any like interest in this. So um, yeah, we'll be meeting monthly. We'll have, uh, we'll bring in some guest speakers, discuss ongoing product support. Um, hopefully discuss any relevant topics within like you know, technology. And then also have access to the space connections that we have, also any equipment in the space and just any research opportunities as well. Um, you wanna go to the next one? So the structure of this organization is just as follows pretty much. We have our e right here, which is just us three right now. We're gonna have also, our project leads, which are pretty much going to be on the same level as the eboard, pretty much leading the team of uh, members within each team. So we have affiliate leads too, which John. I'll talk about I'm, about yeah, I'll talk yeah. more on that. But um, product teams will be working so like wheelchair product or any other product you guys come up with, and then you guys will lead members. And then we also have participants here who don't want to like fully commit to the club. But still want to like learn or like discuss anything about this technology. Yeah, you guys can still like come to the meetings and just learn, or just ask any questions. Really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we want it to be open and have different levels because if you're less technical and you don't want to be like actually working on building building this stuff, you can come and we'll have neuroscience lectures. We'll have some people over from U of R. We're gonna have a pitch competition at the end where people can just kind of come up with neurotech ideas and then pitch them, and we'll have some prizes and stuff. So. You know, it, there's that, but then if you do want to work on your own project, an existing one, we have lab space and hardware, so you can come talk to us. So, yeah, I don't know what to say. That's it's just some more lab space. <laughs> yep. And then, yeah, reiterating some of the stuff I said, just a hub for neurotechnology at RIT. Um, yeah, we hope to build technologies over here that like form from student projects. And then, also, just introducing you into technology and fostering like any information you guys want to know, or pushing down information you guys want to know. Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned, we come from research roots, and so some of that is still going on. Uh, so we had gone through a long process to get approved for human subject research, which um, it's it's a very long process. There are a lot of hoops to jump through, um, and you have to get your research procedure approved by the internal research board, which took us about seven months to to do all of that work. And we got approved in February of 2020 to work with vulnerable populations. So obviously, we shut that down right away because we didn't want to put anyone at risk. But we plan on renewing that this semester, and then next spring we're going to 
conduct uh, a lot of data collection for motor images. So again, this is imagined movement up, down, left, and right. We've developed out the software and done the training, um, but if anyone wants real research experience, we will be publishing a paper on this. It's going to be a less scope than, than originally it was going to be intended to be, but um, you can talk to us. That's an opportunity that, that we can work with you on, um, and we'll train you and you know, uh, get that going. And then uh, Nerd Gear, I will give the stage back to you, John. Awesome. Oh, no, I won't. Nope, nope, nope. I'm <laughs> not yet. Yeah, so I mean, I said, I think I said most of this. Yeah, it's IRB approved. We're going to conduct it in spring 2020. This is just an image from the procedure. You don't really have to worry about that. Hey, no, my chance. Yes. I'm back. Anyway, so this this leads in a bit. I'll start off by what an affiliate lead or an affiliate project is. It's something that's not technically getting funding or resources from NXT, and that's so IP can be retained by the company. I'm leading a startup. It's called Nerd Gear. You can see the logo up there. What we do is we develop ultrasound devices that enhance focus and memory. So this gets a bit into focused ultrasound stimulation, which we talked about before, but a lot of these non-invasive stimulation techniques can be used to either restore or enhance function. In this case, we're on the enhanced side uh, in healthy individuals or the restore side in individuals with ADD or ADHD. Um, and so there's a lot of potential for these technologies. If any of you are interested in any of this, feel free to get in contact with me. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of fun stuff here. I mean, I'd be happy to give the full pitch and I have a full slide deck I can do at a later point, but this is probably not the time for that, even though you guys are a captive audience as we're speaking <laughs> at this moment. Um, so yeah. yeah, no, that, that, that was excellent. And yeah, so like, like Alex said, we want we want NXT to be um, a hub for lots of different ideas. So it can be your own idea for just a project that you want to work on, or it could be a company. And so you can use the hardware. You obviously can't sell the hardware that, that we have, but you can use the hardware and keep your own IP for that. And so we want to be a facilitator for all things uh, neurotech. Um, and so this last one, uh, this again is my business partner, Colin, uh, and we also have a, a media company called the BCI Guys, where we create educational and entertaining content around neurotechnology. Um, so if you guys are interested in seeing more on the content side of that and learning more about it, we have a YouTube channel you can just search BCI Guys, um, and then a website with a bunch of resources as well. We started that in the beginning of 2020. Um, and we've produced a full course. We partnered with a, a large nonprofit in the space um, to produce a, uh, I think it's a full 15 hour course with written content, but we kind of did it in two tracks. So we have videos that we tried to build in, in a crash course style. So instead of lecturing over slides, um, we were sitting at a desk and we had animations and, and lots of stuff like that to try to make it fun and skits and stuff. You could just watch those videos and that would take you about five hours to run through all of that. Um, or you could do that and we're interested, read some of the written content as well. Um, so. If you're really interested in this stuff, um, again, from a non-technical level, but to learn kind of a, a lot of information about the field, this is available for free on YouTube. And then there's a platform where there are links as well uh, to get access to some of the written content. Um, and you can, of course, reach out to us. That's a separate team, but um, for you know any neurotech questions that you have. And so just quickly to go over that, the things that we cover is what is neurotechnology? So what I talked about today a little bit, but more in depth, um, we go into some history, we have a, a five um, lessons on neuroscience. So if you're interested in that piece, uh, different types of neurotechnology. So again, kind of what we did, but we go through like 20 types, I think. Um, neuromodulation, that's what John does, stimulating the brain, causing uh, neurons to activate. We talk about how to actually build brain computer interfaces and some methods. My favorite one was the neuroethics and neurophilosophy one. We dove into cyborg theory, theory of the mind, uh, humanism, things like that. Um, that was really fun. And then we talk about who's funding the industry. Um, and uh, not a big surprise, it's largely the US government, but there are a lot of uh, corporations that are getting into this as well, like Elon Musk's company, Neuralink. Um, and then we just have some resources over there. Um, yeah, so this is just what it looks like um, in the uh the platform if you want to go backwards as well um and again all of it is entirely free okay so if uh you have any if you have any questions after this that come up uh well one we encourage everyone to join the slack group hopefully a lot of you guys are already in there um but that's where we do most of our communications so um definitely join that 
Uh, and then our general email, it's very long, it's neurotechnologyexploration at gmail.com. So that's a good way to get in touch with us as well. And then I'm realizing now this link is wrong because I have to do something. But if you go to nxtr.org, um, that's our main website. And I put together a resources page where you can access all of the important stuff for that we have worked on. Um, so if you were if you want to work on a project, you can get some stuff there and then just general narrative resources as well. I know this is a tremendous amount of information right now. So this is these things are really more like future stuff if you're working on a project and just letting you know that we have the resources for that. Um, but I think that brings us to the end. Yes, it does. So um, yeah, if anybody has questions, uh, we encourage you to ask them 